3, 2, 1. Hello everyone, my name is Hamza Minhaj. I'm from Karachi Grammar School representing Team Pakistan. I'm joined here by my friends Rafi Motiwala, Suleiman Dwani, Rayan Khan and Ahmed Rajvi. And I just wanted to say that it's been such a great experience participating in this competition thus far. And we're super, super excited to present our solutions to you. Um, so guys, let's get started. Question 1. The law of one price states that the price of identical goods must remain the same worldwide irrespective of the geographical location. It occurs in the presence of free competition and price flexibility and the absence of trade frictions. A. How does the law of one price assume a theoretical frictionless market and what factors can go against it? And will be presenting a solution to this question. Right. So, the law of one price assumes factors such as perfect competition, free movement of goods and factors of production, and consumer rationality. In reality, however, markets are not frictionless and various factors such as cultural preferences, sales taxes, and trade barriers and transport costs can cause differences in prices. So the thing is, in reality, perfect competition cannot arise because there's always some barriers to entry within markets. Furthermore, free movement of goods and factors of production is impossible because there's always some costs associated with transportation. And consumers are not rational in nature because they have, uh, they get influenced by herd mentality, heuristics, framing, and many more psychological aspects. Okay, 1B. Using the supply and demand diagram, demonstrate how trade barriers can cause violations of the law of one price. So on this supply and demand diagram, we've shown how the imposition of trade barriers, for example, an import quota, by country A being the, the exporting country and country B being the importing country, imp imposing such a barrier, causes su supply to shift left as cost of production rises. This, in turn, violates the law of one price as it causes um, price to increase from P1 to P2. One C. Provide a real world example of the law of one price failing to hold. Right. So, gasoline prices in different US states demonstrate the failure of the law of one price within a single country. Factors such as state taxes, transportation costs, local regulations, market competition, and supply and demand variations lead to significant price disparities for identical gasoline products across states highlighting the complexity of pricing even within the unified market. Now we will move on to question two. So question two states, third degree price discrimination occurs when a company charges a different price to different consumer groups. A, what conditions allow firms to segment markets and charge different prices? Okay, so third degree price discrimination is when the same product is sold to different consumers at different prices as different consumers have different PEDs and this is the most common form of price discrimination practiced by monopolists. The primary condition required to practice price discrimination is that a firm must be a price maker and this is only possible if the firm has a majority majority's, uh, market share. The, the products must be unique and differentiated which means that it has less substitutes. Different markets must have different elasticities of demand. Okay, so 2B, how can third degree price discrimination impact consumer surplus? Give an example of third degree price discrimination and its effect on consumers. So let's start by defining what consumer surplus is. So consumer surplus is actually the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and the price they actually pay. So I'm going to give an example of something that applies in my country within Karachi in Pakistan. So what happens is that um, electricity rates, right? They get they are varied from location to location. So that's a that's a form of geographical um, price discrimination. So what happens is Karachi is divided into commercial and residential areas. So the electricity rate that's given to commercial areas is significantly higher than the than the electricity rate given to residential areas. And the reason why this happens is because without electricity, you cannot do any, it's like a vital means of production, right? You need it to produce anything, right? You need it to, for any economic activity, you need electricity. Without electricity, you cannot produce anything. So thus, it becomes, thus the demand for electricity in commercial activities is inelastic compared to residential air, uh, activities, where you might use other means to, for whatever work you need to do at home, okay? So I'm gonna build a model based on this. And I'm going to say that a luxury firm discriminating prices would charge $15 per unit to commercial areas and $8 per unit to residential areas. And based on this, we'll be going ahead. So let's analyze the residential segment. Before price discrimination, since the demand was relatively elastic, they may have been willing to pay $10.
So by charging a price of $8, $8 they actually have a consumer surplus of $2. Now we'll analyze the commercial segment. Before price discrimination, since the demand is relatively inelastic, they have been willing to pay $13. So by charging a price of $15, the, price is, has, has, the, the firm has successfully gained a consumer surplus of $2. So overall, third degree price discrimination can lead to a real allocation of consumer surplus where some customers benefit from lower prices and an increased surplus, but others may pay more than they would have under a single price strategy. This illustrates the concept that businesses aim to capture as much consumer surplus as possible while still offering pro products or services to different consumer segments. This also allows firms to maximize their revenue. And this will be shown in this um, diagram as well. So a firm initially producing at, at uh, a price of PO and a quantity QO. So this is the demand at that. Um, QO is the demand at this price, right? But let's say they start segmenting the market. They're like, okay, maybe the demand for other, for other consumers in this same market will be higher at different prices, right? What they start doing is they start ch charging those consumers a different price, which leads to a higher quantity for them overall and maximize, revenue, maximize profits and maximize revenue as well. So we'll be going ahead to question three now. I'm oh, sorry, two C. Discuss the fairness issues associated with third degree price discrimination. Uh, Rafi will be doing this part. Okay. So first, let's look at the first one, yeah. So price discrimination is unfair to those who are paying a higher price. So through price discrimination, we see that due to the fact that firms are seeking to maximize their profits, they are charging some uh, customers more than others. Um, now, the, the scenario here is that solely because one firm or one customer or consumer values a good more than the other, or their, um, their demand for that good is more inelastic, meaning maybe they have, uh, they've seen less substitutes for that good. Um, they find it more inelastic. The firms are basically exploiting that and are charging them higher prices. So therefore, it is quite unfair for them. Let's look at the second point. Competition is driven out through predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is basically done uh, by big firms to drive out new competition. So when there's competition in the market, uh, it creates uh, basically between firms there's going to be innovation and therefore if there's too much innovation or a smaller firm is making a better product, the consumers will go from bigger firms to smaller firms. Therefore, bigger firms may carry out price discrimination and lower their prices for specific uh, customers uh, basically driving the small firms out of business. Lastly, we saw higher profits for the monopolists will lead to undesirable redistribution of income in society. So this is more of a continuation of this point, where because the profits are remaining inside the big firms, it isn't basically going out to small firms. So we'll be going on to question three now. So question three is case. What market characteristics enable price discrimination to expand output? Okay, so secondary price discrimination is essentially when the same consumer pays different prices for different quantities of the same good, right? So firms with significant market power, such as a monopoly or oligopoly, are better positioned to implement quantity-based price discrimination. This is because they can set different prices for various quantities without the risk or uh, the risk of intense competition from other firms. In, market, uh, in, in a market with diverse consumer preferences and demand elasticity, price discrimination based on quantity can be more effective. Some customers may be willing to buy more at a lower price, but others may be willing to buy a premium for smaller quantities. So they can scale their output and increase their output uh, through the knowledge of this. Okay. Uh, 3D. Using a graph illustrate how second degree price discrimination increases consumer surplus. Okay. So we see that in second degree uh, price discrimination, where basically consumers are paying a certain fee or price for a specific units of the good and then an additional price for continuing units. Um, we can see this specifically in maybe mobile data or Wi-Fi, where you may be started off the starter fee and then if you complete that fee, you have to pay additionally. Let's look at the diagram. So over here, we see that at Q0, we have the price of A. But as we see that the quantity is increasing, we also see that the utility of using that good is decreasing. Therefore, 
the, the maximum amount a consumer would be willing to pay for that good is decreasing. And therefore, the maximum price that the firm would charge to, in, to basically maximize that person's, oh, sorry, uh, completely reduce that person's consumer surplus, in other words, maximize the amount they'd be willing to pay, would also decrease. So over here, we see that so as the firm is increasing their quantity, it's also decreasing its price because the utility towards each um, unit, additional unit, is decreasing. On your 3C, when can second degree price discrimination potentially benefit consumers? Provide examples of differential pricing, improving affordability, and access to consumers. Okay, so a, speci a specific example is how at movie theaters, um, customers are charged different prices. So, for example, children are able to pay less while adults are able to pay more. So this increases affordability and, um, and accessibility for consumers. Um, and now we move on to four. Thumbs up. Question four. Evaluate the trade-offs involved in using the Robinson Backman Act to protect small business members, businesses versus adhering to the consumer welfare standard. In your response, analyze the economic incentives created by the law and the potential impact on, on producer and consumer welfare. Use economic theories and concepts such as price combination, consumer surplus, and deadweight loss to support your analysis. So the Robert Patman Act uh, protects small businesses by enforcing, by sorry, by preventing price discrimination, which would which would give large retailers an unfair advantage. This is because when, for example, uh, price discrimination can be done for large firms who are buying a greater quantity, they may be offered a lower price, whereas small firms who are buying less may be offered a less price. This presents an unfair advantage to large firms. Economic incentives. The act dis discourages producers from offering lower prices to large retailers, thereby leveling the playing field for small retailers. Impact on small retailers. Small businesses may benefit from reduced competition with large retailers, potentially leading to increased sales and hence survival in the market. The consumer welfare standard uh, comprises of several benefits. Firstly, consumer prices. Adhering to the consumer welfare standard promotes, promotes lower prices for consumers. When producers can offer discounts to large retailers, these savings can be passed on to consumers in the form of lower prices. Consumer surplus. Consumer surplus, which represents the extra benefit consumers receive when they pay less than they're willing to, is maximized when prices are lower. In, enforcing the Robert Batman Act, we reduce consumer surplus if prices increase. Efficiency. The consumer welfare standard prioritizes efficiency and, alloc and allocator efficiency. Price discrimination can lead to a more efficient allocation of resources, benefiting both producers and consumers. Over here we can see our demand and supply diagram. Um, uh, uh, impo uh, imposing the Robert Batman Act causes supply to shift left and consumer surplus to fall from initially A, B, C, to area C. This causes a deadweight loss of area B. Price discrimination. Price discrimination can enhance market efficiency by allowing producers to charge different prices to different retailers based on their willingness to pay. It can lead to a more optimal allocation of goods. Deadweight loss. Enforcing the Robert Batman Act, as I illustrated on the diagram, may lead to deadweight loss in the market, as prices would be higher for consumers and some small retailers may not be able to compete efficiently. Consumer choices. Consumer choices may be limited if the act reduces the, the diversity of retail options and forces some retail, small retailers out of the market. We thank you all for your time.